Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm Megan O'Sullivan, the chair of the North America Trilateral Commission, and I want to welcome you all to another of our virtual meetings. Um, it's going to be a feisty meeting. If uh, our green room experience is any indication, we've got two people who are wide awake over here at eight o'clock on the East Coast. Um, uh, both uh, wonderful speakers on a topic that is very, very timely. Um, which has gotten a lot of attention due to recent um, cyber attacks, but but also probably deserves even more attention than we've been able to give it given the um, abundance of news. Uh, so we'll be talking about the world of cyber and drawing on David Sanger's uh, great book and fabulous documentary. Hopefully many of you took the opportunity to watch the HBO documentary. Um, if you didn't and you still would like a link to it, please let us know. We can provide that to you even if you don't subscribe to HBO. I'm just going to introduce uh, Jane and let her introduce the wonderful David Sanger. Jane Harmon, you know well, a very dedicated and uh, valued member of the Trilateral Commission and our board. Jane uh, was a congresswoman from California for I think 16 years, if I'm correct, and has spent the last uh, 10 years as CEO and president of the Wilson Center. This is her last month in that role, actually. So I'd like to take this moment to just congratulate her on a, a great tenure as the head of that institution. Um, she's done a wonderful job there and I'm looking forward to see what she wants to do next. Hopefully spend more time with the Trilateral Commission. So Jane, uh, if I could hand it over to you, I'm really excited to, to hear from David and, uh, and from you. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you, Megan. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, good whatever to uh, many people. I have already had a cup of coffee and David is having one now. So we're wide awake and this is a great subject. I also want to say about you, Megan, uh, for those who don't know you, storied background uh, in government, uh, a long time teaching at Harvard. Uh, we all were on, or we, a few women, including you and me, on a delegation last year to the Doha Security Conference, one of the last times anybody could travel anywhere on the planet. And we, we scared them. We were, uh, you know, your red hair and, and my feistiness and the rest of it. Uh, but what my point about this is women are really good on security issues. And I'm really proud of you and your leadership of the Trilateral Commission. And I'm proud to be on your executive committee. I also want to salute the prior leadership of Joe Nye. I'm not sure he's on this call, but Joe is a mentor to both of us and uh, still going strong and at a young 80s age. Uh, but hey, uh, at Harvard. So, uh, and one more thing, congratulations on your bravery for bringing two young women into this world, uh, Maeve and Margot, uh, who will be digital natives. So they will understand much better than I do what David uh, Sanger is talking about. But that doesn't uh, block me from, from plowing in and, and, and uh, having, I think, the third go uh, of, uh, of talking to him about this book. So, um, the discussion today is about uh, the HBO documentary, The Perfect Weapon, which is based on David Sanger's, a former Wilson Center Fellows book of the same name. The title refers to the increasingly sophisticated cyber weapons that our enemies, both state and non-state actors, have developed and which are still um, uh, dismally uh, uh, unable to, and which we are still dismally unable to deter. Uh, but I'd like to think that the book and documentary title also refers to David Sanger himself, whom I consider, here we go, to be the perfect weapon in the Wilson Center's arsenal of former scholars. Anytime there is a serious long form piece on anything cyber, I always know David will be the principal author or I don't read it. He's been a New York uh, Times reporter for 38 years, get that and is currently their national security correspondent. Uh, before David wrote The Perfect Weapon, he wrote several other books. One was Confront and Conceal, Obama's Secret Wars and Surprising Use of American Power in 2012. And a second, The Inheritance, The World Obama Confronts and Challenges on American Power. He wrote that one in 2009, physically at the Wilson Center, which is why it's such a good book. Uh, and of course, David's latest book is so important that it's now a documentary. Uh, David, no pressure, but we're looking for an Academy Award and the Wilson Center will be mentioned. So today we're going to discuss how nation states compete in cyberspace and why the problem is only getting worse 
not better, and not just nation states and non-state actors compete in cyberspace. So I think this is a conversation. Um, I don't think David is presenting. So David, would you please tell us why you wrote the book and how you adapted it uh, to be a very, very interesting documentary? Uh, well, first, thanks, Jane. Thanks for, for doing this. And thanks to uh, Megan and, and Richard for uh, gathering um, the Trilateral Commission for this. I, I had to laugh uh, when Megan said that you were leaving the Wilson Center to, I thought she was going to say, spend more time with your grandchildren. But instead, she said, spend more time with the Trilateral Commission. <laughs> Doesn't everybody? <laughs> so, One of my grandchildren. I mean, that's what? right. Um, uh, and, um, and congratulations to Megan, for whom a, an 8 a.m. Um, a meeting like this is actually sort of a vacation compared to feeding two small children at, at this hour. Um, Jane, you've done a really astounding work uh, over a decade uh, at the Wilson Center. And as you said, I've been lucky enough to be a fellow there twice. And it's, it's really a remarkable place full of all kinds of remarkable ideas. And, um, you know, Jane wandering down to your office every once in a while saying, write faster, write faster. We want more books out of this place. So uh, she says she's going to be a, a very hard, hard act uh, to follow. Um, the Perfect Weapon was written because it became pretty clear to me in my uh, work on national security at the Times, really from the uh, mid part of the Bush administration, that cyber was becoming not sort of some sideshow in, um, uh, in national security, but actually the main show, because no one wanted to take the United States military on directly, uh, particularly uh, major adversaries. They knew how that would result, what that would result in. And cyber was really the best way to be able to have a deniable weapon that is dirt cheap, and that unlike nuclear weapons, you can use every day, not with the same kind of, a, of effect, but as a short of war weapon. And the advantage of a short of war weapon is that if you calibrate it right, the United States and its allies are not going to come back and visit you for a cyber attack with B-52s or some kind of military action. And so it's a way of gradually degrading and bleeding a major power or a minor power uh, with a weapon that is incredibly cheap to put together. Think about it, for nuclear weapons, you need uranium, you need plutonium, you need billions of dollars of facilities. Think of what the North Koreans have done and, and how they have uh, basically impoverished themselves financing this incredibly expensive nuclear program and are the they're hardly the only ones. But when it, they needed to go retaliate against Sony for uh, a really terrible movie called The Interview, um, sorry if I've insulted uh, anybody here who's a, a, a big favor, a big um, fan of, of uh, that film, but it was a film, basically a comedy about the assassination of Kim Jong-un. And when the North Koreans couldn't get any satisfaction from Sony, and when the uh, United Nations Secretary General declined their invitation to go intervene in Hollywood and try to kill the movie, as if the UN Secretary General had that power, what did they do? They uh, took a, a young hacker that they had trained in China, had him form a team, and from Thailand and Malaysia and elsewhere, they not only got into Sony, but they patiently went out, figured out how they would be able to melt down 70% of their computing power and start one of the biggest cyber attacks out there. How did the United States try to stop the Iranian nuclear program? With Olympic Games, better known as Stuxnet, a, uh, an effort to get into their computer systems and thus blow up their centrifuges, thinking that they were, the Iranians were much less likely to retaliate than that than they would if the Israelis and the Americans had gone and bombed the site. And now we're in a world of constant cyber attack, as you have seen from solar winds, the incredibly sophisticated Russian attack on both the federal government and private industry. We can talk about that some more later. So uh, you wrote the book, 
just to answer my own question. And, and, and the documentary was made to explain this, uh, both the sophistication of the attacks and the difficulty of response. Um, I'm putting words in your mouth, but, but hey, yeah. I, I've done that before. Uh, but let's go through the, at least the, the three uh, big attacks in the book and then let's pivot, this is what I would like to do, uh, to the uh, most recent Russian attack because I have a theory about it. And of course you're gonna tell me I'm wrong but that doesn't dissuade me from asking you. Stuxnet, um, I was still in Congress when that was going on. Uh, some of you may remember you know, back in another century but actually early in this century uh, that I served in Congress. and. Um, that was an incredibly sophisticated uh, attack. Uh, I think people would be interested, since you speak, you can do cyber English, which most people can't do. You can explain complex material in English that even I can understand. If you explain what we did, and, sure. uh, uh, and you're not going to explain how you learned about it, but, hmm. uh, but at any rate, explain what we did. It, it was astounding. It's still astounding to me. Well, part of how we learned about it is that it made itself out in public, which people sort of oh, forget because um, uh, the code got became public. Uh, but it was incredibly sophisticated and it gets to one of the hardest questions, which is how can we go complain about everybody else in the world who is attacking us when we are using this as a major weapon in our arsenal? Remember, we now have a United States Cyber Command. It is um, a full command right up there with... Um, Central Command, which does the Middle East, and Northern Command, which defends the US, and uh, Southern Command, and, and, and so forth. Um, and what do they do? They do operations like Stuxnet. So what was it? So the Iranians were producing nuclear material. And we knew, as I suggested before, that bombing them was not an option, particularly if you had just invaded a country on the pretense that it was developing nuclear weapons. And it turned out when you got there that they weren't anymore. Previously, they had been. Um, so one day, a group of intelligence officials and uh, uh, generals came to President Bush and said, sir, we've got another way to do this. The centrifuges are run like almost every industrial process is run by a set of computer-related controllers. Now, the Iranians had walled these off from the internet. It was not like you could go into your computer and, and hack into it. But they said, if we can get code into that, and we think we can, then we could speed up or slow down those centrifuges until they destroy themselves. And it'll take the Iranians a year or a year and a half just to figure out what happened, much less who did it. And so they actually built in Tennessee a model of the Iranian uh, facility. They then attacked it with code when they managed to blow up the centrifuges. They took the shards of it and they uh, drove them through the Northwest gate of the White House and dumped them out on the Situation Room table and invited the president to come down and look. And the president, President Bush, who Megan worked for, uh, did come down and look. And Megan will uh, rec recall uh, incidents like this. Um, president Bush used a, a vivid Texas epithet to describe what he saw, and they took that as approval to go ahead with the operation. <laughs> uh, and um, so they did. And it worked really well until about the second year of the Obama administration in 2010, when one day the code got out. And this is one of the risks people don't think about with cyber attacks. And once it got out, it became pretty clear uh, that uh, what was making these centrifuges blow up was no accident. And at that point, the Russians, the Chinese, the Iranians, they all had the code. What my reporting showed was I tracked it back to the Situation Room and two presidents making the decision and the handoff to go do it. And you may recall that got the FBI a little revved up and led to about a four year long leak investigation during which time my dearest friends had to pretend that they didn't know me, except for you, Jen, you, you stuck with me. So well, here we are. I got to say, uh, I, of the brilliant things the United States has done over history, we've also done some dumb things. This was way up there. I mean, it's just spectacularly impressive uh, that we that we were able to mount this. It but was, now let's but it also it also had a, a downside, which President Obama predicted, which was that every nation in the world 
that that wanted to go attack us for some reason could suddenly say, oh, the Americans do it, so no problem with us yeah. doing it. So it All really right, so, did touch off this age. So let's go there. I want to discuss also the Sony hack and, and the Russians. Oh, oh, yes, the Russians. But uh, um, yes, it was a permission slip to others. Um, but talk about our response, uh, you know, talk about how, and, and you, you deal with this in, in the book all, all through all these things, how difficult it is for us to decide how to respond to cyber attacks. So the major problem with responding to a cyber attack is that, as I said, it's a short of war operation. And frequently you are attacked by countries that are a lot less wired than you are. So, you know, when an adversary looks at the United States, it sees nothing but targets. Do we take out um, the financial system? Do we take out utilities? Do we take out a water system? Just yesterday in Florida, uh, a, uh, the police announced that a water system was hacked through an industrial control system, very much like Stuxnet, but a lot less sophisticated, probably was just some local people messing around. And they added or tried to add by computer controls a thousand times the amount of lye that is normally put in the water supply. Now, an engineer caught this and reversed it right away. But if somebody had not been awake to go catch it, you could imagine the poisoning you could do to an entire town that way. Um, so uh, these responses by the US when it's a foreign adversary are difficult because if the adversary is inside your system and you do something to the adversary, you're not sure you can control the escalation. And you know, for all of us who have, you know, were trained back in Cold War courses on these things, escalation dominance, making sure that you can control it and the adversary knows you will come out on top is important. So in the Sony case, they all met in the situation room and the president's first question was, is this even a federal government issue? I mean, Sony's a private company and it's not exactly critical infrastructure. I mean, we all like going to the movies, but does the US go to war over with North Korea over an attack on Sony? And they all said no. So what was it? Well, at one point, President Obama called it um, digital vandalism. That was a little light, but it was sabotage for sure. And the North Koreans bet rightly that we were not going to come after them in a big way. Well, you, you keep saying that this is maybe a, a, a lesser degree of harm than let's, let's imagine a nuclear attack. Sure, it's lesser that, degree of harm. But, you know, if you poison a water system and you kill millions of people, uh, hello. I mean, they, they, they haven't been, uh, you know, reduced to dust, but they're reduced to dead. Uh, so I'm, I'm just wondering, can, can we really say that anymore uh, about these things? And let's take the Sony attack, because that's the second one I wanted to talk about. That was a private sector entity, and it was a really bad movie, just saying, uh, really bad. But you managed to talk to Seth Rogen, and you... Uh, managed to get the, all the color of the incident. And as I understand it, Sony was devastated economically. And that is not only one of our larger corporate enterprises, but it's also the employer of a whole bunch of folks who were harmed. So can you really say that, 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 that cyber attacks are of a lesser degree of harm than uh, conventional attacks? Well, in the case of Sony, um, there was a lot of corporate harm done, for sure. It was interesting, when the North Koreans got in, they were very patient. They were there for three months exploring the system. The first thing they did was they released some emails that they got in the Sony system, just as sort of a warning to the company. Mm -hmm. It sort of foreshadowed what the Russians would do in the 2016 election. Remember, this was 2014 when the, when the attack happened. Um, that wasn't much of a story for us uh, at the New York Times because mostly the emails showed that Hollywood producers go out for extraordinarily long lunches that are very, very expensive and gossip about the stars. <laughs> they gossip, yeah. Yes, they right. Gossip. So we learned from these, this trove of emails, the vital national security information, that Angelina Jolie can be extremely difficult to work with on the set. Okay. 
Um, we didn't we didn't do much. Surprise! With this, Surprise! Right? Yeah. We didn't okay. do this much with this story, but the National Enquirer had a really great time. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, but what did they do a month later? They actually got into the system, put up, you see this in, in the movie, you see what Sony employees saw on their screen, and it was a distraction while their hard drives were being erased. Right. And in about two and a half minutes, Sony lost 70% of their computer power. Right. Now, to your question about the nature of the attack, imagine that the North Koreans didn't have access to cyber to do this. How would they have had a similar effect on Sony? Well, they would have had to land some saboteurs at Long Beach and take an Uber up to the Sony tour if it was running, as it is not now, and get on the tour with all the kids and then split off from it and stick some dynamite under the computer center and blow it sky high. And I can tell you, and you guys would know better than I, that whoever was president at that time, whether it was Barack Obama or Donald Trump or Joe Biden, if you saw an a, a act of domestic terrorism that blew up the Sony Computer Center and maybe killed a few people along the way, you'd have to order something to blow up in Pyongyang. And the most amazing thing was they got the same result and nothing blew up in Pyongyang. So that really gets at why it is for them and for states like North Korea, the perfect weapon. So, so let's discuss that in reverse. After uh, Stuxnet, as I understand it, uh, Iran uh, at least is suspected mm -hmm. of uh, launching cyber attacks on the, the Saudi state oil company Aramco, uh, Qatari natural gas uh, firm Raz Gas, uh, Las Vegas Sands Corporation uh, in Las Vegas. They, they, they took out the Sands. US. They took yeah. out the Sands Casino. Can you imagine a nastier thing to do to Americans than to I, take I, out their casinos? I mean, really. I found it heartbreaking personally. Yeah. But um, what was our response to that? Uh, there so, was no response to that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the Sands Casino attack happened because it was owned by Sheldon a a Adelson, who, who just um, Sheldon Adelson, who just, just, just passed, passed away, away. Yeah. maybe a month or two ago, mm -hmm. and he had been at Yeshiva University in New York and suggested that the way to go deal with the Iranian nuclear program was to explode a nuclear weapon in the in the empty desert in Iran and tell them that Tehran was next. Well, it turns out the Iranians watch YouTube. And they saw this and they said, hmm, Mr. Adelson, he owns something in the desert too, doesn't he? Be a pity if uh, they walked into the Sands Casino and nothing happened. And that's exactly what they did three months later. They basically, it was very much like the Sony attack. They wiped the hard drives and uh, the uh, casino spent months trying to hide this from, from happening. So again, the US decided you know, that what happened in Vegas could stay in Vegas and that uh, there was no particular reason for the U.S. to go respond to this. Meanwhile, the Iranians had also attacked our financial system, not terribly effectively, but they had done it. And they had tried to get into a small dam in Westchester County, New York, uh, right near where I grew up. Uh, had they called me, I could have told them that kids play on the dam because there's no water behind it. Uh, but uh, it was an interesting example of um, the fact that uh, that these systems are all pretty vulnerable. Yeah, well, uh, just more evidence of how indispensable you are, David. They should have called you. Um, but let's move to Russia because I want to get to audience questions and Cassandra will field them and uh, in a few minutes. Let's go to Russia. Um, I think most people uh, now believe uh, I know there are a few who don't, uh, that Russia uh, interfered with our election in 2016, that we expected interference with election machinery in 2020. I don't want to upset anybody on this call, but I don't think there was any interference with election machinery in 2020. But it turns out that uh, there wasn't that interference, but then there was this other massive uh, Russian hack that we learned about I guess after the election. We learned now, about it in December, yep. In December. So uh, just a question, David, uh, and I, I'm blaming you for this. Why didn't somebody figure out earlier that, that this was a decoy operation that we all expected and we surged all of our stuff on our election machinery for 2020 and Russia never intended to attack that, but it was really gonna do something else. 
Well, I'm not sure they didn't initially intend to attack it, but they quickly came to the conclusion after the 2016 success that in 2020, the Americans would be waiting for them, both on the disinformation side and on the actual attack side. And remember, Russia is an interesting case because it's capable, it has shown a capability to go do both. So there was the disinformation, which we learned about well after the 2016 mm -hmm. election, that was getting into Facebook and you know pretending that I was um, Megan and Richard's uh, next door neighbor and suggesting you know that they show up at a protest and then meanwhile organizing a counter protest and just trying to feed off of the natural dissent in the American system. So that's one set of hacking. And that doesn't really require the internet. The Russians have been doing disinformation for forever, but the internet supercharges it. The other was the effort to get into registration systems and so forth, which they tried in 2016. In 2018, in the midterm elections, the National Security Agency pushed back pretty hard. They um, basically froze the computers at the um, Internet Research Agency, which had been so active in, in St. Petersburg. They uh, sent warnings to specific officers of the GRU saying, we know where you live and we know what you're doing. And so that was a bit of pushback. And so the Russians at some point calculated, you know, if they're going to put all their defenses into the election system, let's go look at something else. Yeah. And what they looked at was a piece of software that most people, including me, had barely paid any attention to in uh, previous years. It was made by a company named Solar Winds in Texas. Right. And this software is used by most Fortune 500 companies, a lot of government agencies. And what it does is basically manage your internet traffic. The New York Times used Solar Winds. Why? Because on a big news day like impeachment today, there'll be 20, 30, 40 million people coming to the Times site. And you have to make sure that you can balance your load and churn the news out to all of them and all that. But this all runs in the background. And what did the Russians do? They got into the updating system for it yep. so that once they were in the code, it would flow into every company that uploaded a new version. What's this like? It's like the upload that takes place when you um, send your phone up for an update overnight. What do you do? You plug it in, right? Apple updates it. And um, Jane, I know in the morning when you get your updated phone, the first thing you do is you go through every line of code that of Apple put into that to make sure that they have not introduced a flaw into your phone so that people could get into vital Wilson Center memos. Um, of course not. Nobody does that. And the Russians were counting on the fact that no one would do it in solar winds either. And so that created a series of backdoors that brought them into the systems, right. even without getting into, into passwords. So um, do we know yet how extensive the damage is? We have attributed it, <laughs> I think, yes. to them so far as the I know. The intelligence agencies have attributed it to them. And, Shockingly, and most companies don't want to reveal whether or not they were damaged, right? A lot of government agencies don't want to reveal how much damage there was done. The, the Department of Homeland Security issues instructions to all American companies mm -hmm. and others, if you're hacked, you should report it. You should make public if it's a big hack, you know what it is. And who's the first one to violate that? US government agencies. Right? All right. <laughs> okay. So um, no one wants to do it. While we've been talking, um, Joe Biden's been on the phone wanting to talk to you. You're so popular that he yeah, has a hard sure, time getting right. through. And he says, David, uh, I need to respond uh, to this uh, solar winds, uh, you know, colossally huge attack that, and we're not discussing all of the implications in public, but what, what is the part of my response that I can discuss in public? What should my So interestingly, be? even during the transition, he came out and said he would respond and perhaps respond in kind and that they would pay a price. He didn't say what kind of price. Right. At the same time, the sitting president, uh, Donald Trump, 
was uh, saying, well, maybe the Chinese did this, even though he had intelligence uh, in front of him that said that the Russians did it. Uh, he did, did that in one set of tweets and never discussed it again and never got a response going. Frankly, putting the response together, and I've been talking to a lot of Biden's folks about this, is not easy for the reason we suggested earlier. If you know that the Russians have littered your systems with back doors, and then you respond, maybe with financial sanctions, maybe with a cyber attack on you know, their ability to, to send oil or gas out of the country, uh, maybe by revealing uh, Vladimir Putin's um, you know, hidden estate and, uh, and the billions he's stored away. Uh, you know, big news, Vladimir Putin's got billions of dollars stored in the financial system, right? All of these would be options. But do you wanna do that until you understand how deeply Putin is in your system. Because if his answer to that is, you know, you just saw phase one of solar winds and phase right. two is we shut down your electric grid, you may not want to go down that road. So it's a really hard decision. So that's, this is my final question. Get ready everybody for your questions. Um, somebody named Ben Buchanan, whom you know well, who teaches yep. at Georgetown and has been uh, of course, at the Wilson Center also has written a book, wrote a book at the Wilson Center called The Cybersecurity Dilemma. And The Cybersecurity Dilemma, which I actually understand, at least superficially, is that in order to understand if somebody is coming after you, you have to be in their system. And The Cybersecurity Dilemma is if you're in their system, even if it's benign, just to under, to, as a defensive move, uh, what you're doing could be misunderstood. This goes both directions. You mentioned early the danger of miscalculation. And obviously we just discussed how complicated it is to calibrate a response. But um, we kind of sort of in, in uh, uh, the Cold War uh, in the nuclear standoff had a, a doctrine of mutual assured destruction. Is there any way that this uh, dilemma uh, can lead to sensible, but I mean, well, of course it can lead to sensible behavior, but what are the dangers of miscalculation in the, in the cyber sphere that, that are less, less present in the nuclear sphere? Um, I actually think there are many more opportunities for miscalculation in cyber, partly because there are so many more players. Think about it. In nuclear, we only have nine states right now that have nuclear weapons. We have at the time I wrote the book in 2018, uh, we had 35 states that we sort of judged could launch a sophisticated attack. Mm -hmm. And that leaves out criminal groups, terrorist groups, and worst of all, teenagers, uh, all of whom have cyber weapons and know how to use them. Okay, uh, so um, I see I see Richard wincing there because he is the father of teenagers. I'm You've sure just they don't scared do this, this entire but they may have friends. But we have know? grandchildren that age too. This is that's really right. Good. Yeah, edit what you say, David. Edit what you say. That's right. Uh, so uh, so the difficulty here is that the mutually assured destruction concept does not work when the Chinese leader can say that wasn't us. That was a group of kids working at Shanghai University, and you've got kids who do things at your universities that you don't know about. You don't want us blowing each other up because of work, right? And of course, the Chinese hire hackers who are not working for the government to do their bidding, as do the Russians and others, as part of the effort to go hide it. But back to Ben's cybersecurity dilemma, and that was a great book, and so was his follow-on book, The Hacker in the State. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, in the course of uh, those books, what you discover is, of course, the United States is deep in other countries' systems. And the, the ridiculous element of this is that we um, go ballistic when we discover that the Russians have code inside our, our utility grid. And people run around and say, oh, no, the Russians are going to turn off all the power from Boston to New York or Washington or from Seattle to LA. And yet when we are in their systems, they, we call it preparing the battlefield or gathering intelligence. And the nature of cyber is that the same node that you put into a system to go gather intelligence, you could also activate to destroy things. 
And that's the solar winds dilemma, right? right? That right now we only know that the Russians use this to gather data. Well, we all spy on each other, okay? So that, that's fine. But we don't know is what they could use that access to do later. That is a perfect end to uh, uh, my conversation with you, my friend. I mean, for the moment, this will continue forever uh, in a life friendship. But Cassandra, I'm sure there are others who want to ask questions. Great. So just as a reminder, you can find the raise hand function at the bottom of your screen. It's under the reactions button. And I'll turn first to Ambassador Jiro Fujisaki. You're muted. Please ask your question. He's muted, if he can hear me. Hi, Ambassador. Can't hear you. Can you yeah. hear me now? Yes. Yeah. OK. Hi, David. Uh, Hi. Thank Good you very you. much for your fascinating book. I've read it and I learned a lot. Uh, my question is simple. Maybe you have already answered the question by saying that uh, Chinese would say, that's not us. You said that. And from that, uh, because uh, cyber is so invisible and uh, it's, the real point is that it's not like nuclear arsenals or whatever, you cannot detect it. And uh, if so, uh, there's no, there could be no meaningful multilateral code of conduct uh, in United Nations, mm -hmm. which they are trying to or uh, develop, or there could be no uh, uh, arms control type of agreement uh, uh, like START or whatever. So it's just that uh, 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 this cannot be controllable. Is that the uh, real issue here? Well, first of all, great to see you, Fujisaki-san. And mm -hmm. your background you. makes me wish is in Japan. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, the, actually, actually, this is a view from my home window, but the problem is that that's a good part. The uh, bad part is uh, these trees are not mine. It's oh, neighbors. <laughs> okay, that's all right. <laughs> so um, the, the answer to your question, and it's a, a really good question, is um, uh, can these codes of conduct work? And I actually believe in the concept that we need to have some kind of digital Geneva Convention, right? Mm -hmm. so what, would, what do the Geneva Conventions do? And this, was, this is an idea that Brad Smith, who you mentioned at Microsoft, has, has um, talked about a lot. The Geneva Conventions focused on protecting civilians. And I think that what made them so popular is everybody could agree that you didn't want to have an attack that harmed people who were essentially non-combatants and had no way of, of fighting back. Um, so in the cyber realm, you could say, okay, no attacks in peacetime on the electric grid, because if you turn off the electricity, people are gonna die. People who are in hospitals, people who are in nursing homes, people who are shut into their houses. After the past few years, you might say no attacks on election systems, right? Because we all want to have confidence in our, the integrity of our election system. You might say no attacks on water systems or things like that, just as we were discussing. And people would sign up to it. But as you point out, that requires two things. It requires much better detection systems so that we know if someone's violating it and much better attribution so that we can go back and say, it was the Russians who did this, it was the Chinese who did this, that it may not have been the government, but you have to go find it on your soil. And that is still a difficult thing to do. We're getting better at, at uh, attribution, but it is very much an art and not a science. And uh, even when that happens, you can miss attacks. Think about this. The United States is all over Russia's computer systems, but we did not see solar winds. Now, if Jane was still in Congress, she'd be holding hearings right now, public hearings, I hope, with the NSA explaining, how did you miss this? So far, I haven't heard a lot of discussion in Congress on that issue. But if you can't detect it well, then you can't enforce your code of conduct. So we both need the code, and we need the better detection system. Yeah. Thank you very much. 
All right, so we will turn next to Mr. Antonio Ortiz Mena. Yes, uh, hello, this is Antonio Ortiz from the Mexico section of the North American group. And I have a similar question to Ambassador Fujisaki's. And it is, David, is there any scope, maybe not for an international code, code of conduct, but, but for international cooperation to A, help prevent attacks? Mexico does not have an NSA, and neither do many other large and sophisticated countries. And then to address an attack when mm -hmm. it's taking place. For example, in 2019, Pemex, a state oil company, suffered a, uh, suffered a cyber attack for ransom and was asked for mm -hmm. people Bitcoin. So, you know, what scope is there for international cooperation to prevent and then to deal with situations on the ground to help companies that countries that don't have the capability uh, to deal with this? It's a great question, Antonio. So, um, first of all, some international organizations have tried to band together. NATO, uh, a few years ago, uh, said that a cyber attack could be an Article 5 uh, attack. In other words, right. an attack on one as an attack on all. Now, they've never tested this. And my guess is that you could not get a lot of NATO countries to go take significant action other than to recognize that it happened uh, against uh, one country for attacking another, unless it was such a massive attack that it basically paralyzed the nation. Um, but we do need this. And uh, one of the things that you're beginning to see is that a lot of different cyber organizations gather together. So um, the, the Five Eyes nations um, who cooperate on intelligence, uh, and that includes um, Britain, Canada, the United States, Australia, and New Zealand, they do a lot of information sharing back and forth because they're a, a trusted intelligence sharer. Um, we need to do that on a broader basis. There is no clearinghouse for this right now. Uh, and there needs to be. Um, part of the difficulty is that most countries, including the United States, don't want to share a lot of their intelligence mm -hmm. for fear of revealing the sources and methods. My view is that we have classified so much about cyber that we're actually getting in the way of our own deterrence and that we would actually be safer if we presumed most gathered cyber information was unclassified and could be shared broadly, not only with other nations, but just internally. You know, If, some, if the NSA sees that the Russians are gonna attack a water system and it's classified, they can't tell the water system. Right, you've got to sort of filter it through domestic agencies and it probably takes too long. If I could just interrupt for a second, David, that's where you're so valuable. This is the one compliment you're getting. Uh, what, where you're so <laughs> valuable because we have a free press, we have a very talented reporter, that would be you, uh, who does report on this stuff uh, pretty regularly. And it's not just me, we now have an awful lot of people at the New York Times who do, do this. We've got a very large cyber operation and most other news organizations do as well now. And they're quite active. And I think that that is beginning to force the US government into rethinking a little bit about this. And Solar Winds was a really great example because it was detected by a uh, private cybersecurity firm, right, FireEye, which then revealed it to all of us. You know, they gave the NSA maybe a day or two head start. I'll turn next to Mr. Jacobo Roa Vicens. Thank you very much, uh, uh, David and Jane, for this fascinating uh, discussion. The question is, David highlighted that both attacker and victim in a cyber attack have an incentive to contain the extent of this attack to limit the potential of escalation. However, the attack of uh, the success of attacks like Stuxnet lay precisely in the entire automation in the, in, into the algorithm, uh, granting it autonomy to decide when, how, and to what extent to attack. So uh, therefore, it removes entirely the possibility of uh, you know, conventional ways of limiting escalation. So the question is, to what extent should companies and governments in the Western world expect an increasing proportion of these kind of automated attacks 
and hence have to prepare unconventional or new ways of dealing with the limitations of escalation and retaliation. Thank you. A good question about controlling escalation. So a few things you can do. Um, Joe Nye, who was referenced uh, before, of course, uh, did so much with and still does with the Trilateral Commission, has made the point that deterrence isn't only by punishment, in other words, how you're going to go escalate and respond, a lot of deterrence is by denial. So if you build up your cyber defenses uh, sufficiently, you're basically sending a message to a potential attacker, oh, don't bother, you know? You could go after the Wilson Center, but their cyber defenses are so great that it's just not worth the effort. You'll get, you won't make any progress. So instead you go someplace else, right? And if we could do that on a broader scale, that would be terrific. The problem is that 85% of the activity on the internet is completely in private hands. And so you, we can't mandate that every organization uh, meet certain cyber standards because most of them couldn't afford to go do so. You know, the big utilities are well defended. The big financial institutions are well defended. Uh, a lot of big banks in the United States spend more than a billion dollars a year just in cyber defense, which is pretty astounding. Um, but that just means you're gonna go off and attack the small water system in Florida, right? That probably has barely thought about it. Or you're gonna do ransomware on a, um, on a company or a, or a city that uh, is unprepared. We've seen big ransomware attacks in the United States in the past two years on Baltimore on Atlanta and on a bunch of small towns in uh, Texas and, uh, and, and elsewhere. And most of them had invested very little in, in cyber defenses. And it's a hard thing to go convince people to spend money on if you've got to fill potholes and keep the schools running and fight coronavirus, right? Um, so that's one way of controlling escalation. Um, the second way uh, of doing this is by naming and shaming. And that requires making the intelligence public and having it highly accurate. And we're doing better at that. We've called out the North Koreans and the Russians during the Trump administration, something they did much better than the Obama administration was get out and name actors. We saw the intelligence community come out and name the Russians for solar winds pretty quickly. Um, but those alone have not proved to be sufficient. And now the question is, do you have to take the risk of really escalating the punishment so that as General Nakasone, Paul Nakasone, who runs US Cyber Command has said, other nations fear to go do this. All right, I'll turn next to Dr. Halima Croft. Thank you so much. Um, you've talked about cyber being this short of war weapon. I'm just wondering in your reporting, oops, have you ever found that it came close to not being a short of war weapon that actually the type of attack may have triggered some type of formal response? And if it was ever going to cause a sort of military response, where would that probably happen? It's a great question, Dr. Croft. So we've seen one case of a military response to a cyber attack. Um, it was a very small cyber attack uh, conducted, uh, I think, by a Hezbollah group against the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces. Wasn't a big deal, but the IDF had found the building where the hackers operated and sent up a, uh, an aircraft and basically blew the building up. Okay, And then they took a picture of the destroyed building and they put it on the IDF Twitter feed, just in case anybody had missed this. That's the only case I have found of a cyber attack resulting in a military attack. And it does raise the question, is that proportional response or not? If you take a mi relatively minor or even mid-sized cyber attack and you end up killing people, does that fit within the, the, the international laws of war. Um, the other thing to, main to think about is that every major power has built cyber into all of their military operating plans. 
So uh, in the book, you read about a plan that the United States put together early in the Iran crisis called, it was codenamed Nitro Zeus. And basically it was a plan, if you were going to attack Iran, to go take out Tehran's um, electric grid, take out their other services using cyber in hopes that you would not have to bomb them at all. In other words, that you could bring a country into submission without ever dropping a bomb. But as we've discussed and as Jane raised, you could end up killing as many people, turning off the power as you could uh, with a bombing rate. Um, but cyber is built in now to every major military plan. Could I just add one thing to this question? Because it's a great question. Thank you. Um, a number of cyber actors are non-state actors, as you point out, David. They're teenagers, um, you know, are terrorists in our houses. Uh, but seriously, they're, a lot of them are nefarious, and a lot of them are hired by government intelligence services to do the hacking for them. But let's imagine a non-state actor attacking something and causing great harm. Do you imagine that the state in which this harm occurs responds, or how do you respond to a non-state actor attacking a non-state facility or uh, a a imposing ransomware on a on a private company. You know, there's a, a great example of this from 10 years ago. You may remember that there was a big attack on Google that came out of China. And part of it was an effort to get into Gmail and find the Falun Gong, uh, Gong uh, uh, members. And they figured that from their email, they would be able to identify other members and so forth. Some of it was just an effort to steal Google code. So. Google sees this coming and the Google engineers track this back to a university in China. And they're getting ready to go fry the servers in the university in China because you know, they, they see their data out there. And someone has to sort of step in, including the US government and say, whoa, you guys, I, I realize it's very tempting to go strike back. But when you strike back, the Chinese government isn't going to know whether that was government action that was striking back against China, and therefore you're at the beginning of a cyber war and maybe something worse, whether it was Google acting on its own behalf, whether it was Google acting on its own behalf with the permission of the US government. And so you could get into an escalating conflict without anybody in the situation room even knowing that it was going on, which is one of the reasons there's a law in the United States that prohibits companies from actually striking back. Regularly violated, by the way. All right. So, in the interest of time, I think I will ask the following people to please voice their questions aloud, and then Mr. Singer can try to address them with the time we have left. Uh, and Megan would also like to say something at the end, uh, if possible. So, we have Ambassador Boris Rouge. Many thanks. Thanks for this event, and I, I really enjoyed watching the documentary. Um, one question on SolarWinds, David. Um, back in December, Brad Smith said that this constituted a cyber attack, but a lot of people in the cyber community violently disagreed and said this was just espionage. Um, how, what's your take on it? I'd be curious. And now Mrs. Ursula Plasnik. Thank you. Uh, I'm speaking to you from Switzerland and I'm Austrian originally. So you have two small neutral countries. Uh, they become uh, objects of cyber attacks just as well as the bigger guys in town. Now, what's the idea of uh, um, intruders in choosing, in selecting uh, smaller, even neutral countries as part of their um, uh, uh, targeting? It's very difficult in our countries to explain to the general public that uh, cyber attacks are serious and they concern the governments of our countries as well. Thank you. And Ms. Susan Donis. Ms. Donis, would you like to voice your question?
we seem to be having some technical difficulties. Well, I tell you, what, why don't I answer the other two while we try to work out with Susan her uh, voice? So the, on the first question, um, is solar winds a cyber attack? Uh, it's a great question, Boris. And um, Brad and I have spent a lot of time debating this just over the phone, you know, and, and how does it? If it is espionage only, then the answer is, yeah, it's espionage. And most countries, including the United States, don't call espionage cyber attacks, even though I think popularly people would do so. Okay. Um, the problem is, as I suggested before, we don't know if we've seen all of solar winds. If we have, then it wasn't a cyber attack. It was a cyber espionage operation or whether they are using could use those back doors to do something much more nefarious, in which case it would go to become a cyber attack. And that's part of the difficulty with the nomenclature because we're using it in its old fashion. Um, to the question of why neutral countries see cyber attacks, for the same reason that neutral countries saw a lot of activity on their territory during the Cold War. Right, um, Switzerland uh, was a big place for intelligence gathering. Uh, it could be that non-Swiss living in Switzerland are going to be the targets of significant attacks. I've, I understand there are large financial institutions based in Switzerland. There's no bigger target than big financial institutions, right? Because you're going after their transactions or you're trying to rob money as the uh, North Koreans do from a central bank. So there can be all kinds of non-political reasons to go attack a, a country like that. Austria, another great example, home to a large number of United Nations facilities. The IAEA is located in um, uh, Austria and Vienna, as are many other UN operations. Those are all big targets of cyber information operations and sometimes something worse. So it's not the political structure of the country, it's what the country possesses and contains. Ms. Susan Donis. Yes, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Oh, terrific, hi. Uh, I'm the Chief Information Officer of Boeing. Um, and my question is a little bit around what you've alluded to in some of your commentary, which is around the cooperation of the role of private sectors uh, and uh, now the public sector and governments and across the world. Whereas before my impression was this might have been more coordinated and organized uh, in, in uh, more traditional attacks by uh, the government. So how, how has that evolved and what's the role of all of us in this ecosystem? Well, what I find interesting about this, Susan, is that the most effective people at putting together codes of conduct so far have not been governments. It's been private industry, right? Right after the 100th anniversary of the end of World War I, uh, President Macron, as part of the ceremony, organized a, group, a, a declaration about cyber norms of behavior. And it was signed up by a number of governments, but mostly by companies. By the way, only two democracies did not sign, India and the United States, right? Um, the United States does not want to give up what it perceives as an advantage, whether that may be an illusory one or not, in cyber. Um, but industry can push, I think, and can push the government on this much more effectively than most others can because you're the targets and the victims. And if you're Boeing with both a commercial side and a defense side, you've seen it all. And you certainly saw it in solar winds in a, in a significant way. Um, so uh, I think there is a, a, a major opportunity for governments, for companies to push their governments here. And you know, again, the Geneva Conventions offer an interesting historical analogy, because you may remember it was not government that organized the Geneva Conventions. It was the Red Cross, an outside group that is, that is doing it. And you see some other efforts to do this in Switzerland. Uh, back to Ursula's question, there is now 
a new cyber organization that's supposed to get involved in identifying, um, uh, it's based in Geneva, identifying who attacks are coming from on the theory that if you can attribute them more publicly, then you can begin to go mass both government and private industry together. But an additional problem, which I'm sure you've seen, Susan, which is a lot of companies are reluctant to be seen working with the government because they're selling products to an international audience. So if you're Google or Microsoft or Facebook and you are seen working hand in hand with the NSA, then a lot of your foreign customers are going to assume that you're an agent of the US government and they don't wanna make that, that leap. And so there is a lot of, of resistance in the system to having that kind of cooperation. I'm conscious of everyone's time. So I'll turn now to our North American chair, Dr. Megan O'Sullivan, if she has anything she'd like to add. Thank you, Cassandra. And uh, thank you, David and Jane. This has been excellent. We uh, obviously were over our time and I appreciate that people need to go. We do, however, still have over 50 people on the line. And I thought I might, for those who can stay an extra couple of minutes, assuming that includes both of you, I, I wanted to uh, make one comment about cyber and then ask you to comment on a totally different question, uh, which is the, uh, the happenings today in Congress, the historical, um, second impeachment trial, first time a, a U.S. president has been impeached twice. And I ask you that both because um, you you both are, are close to this, um, but also we have an international audience and they might be interested in your views into what's going on. So uh, I'll just make my cyber comment a comment and then ask you both if you would say just briefly a few words about what you expect from today or what you find to be the most interesting and salient um, points. My cyber comment is just, uh, um, and David, maybe Maybe you and I can pursue this offline at some point. Uh, just last week, I received a briefing from someone who was very, very, um, shall we say, uh, nervous about the prospect of cyber attacks on vaccine distribution. And uh, he's someone coming out of the pharmaceutical world and saying this is something that pharmaceutical companies do not think about, that big logistical operations are very subject to, and that as far as he knew, and he had some reason to have some uh, information on this, it was not at all a concern or a priority um, right now. And so I wonder if that is something that should be on everybody's radars as well. Um, but with that comment, if I could ask uh, the two of you just to comment today of, uh, on America's political, what we'll all be watching probably most of the day on television. Jane, you want to go first? I just messed up. Okay, I'm back. Well, first of all, let me just say to David that that was a tour de force, gotta say. Um, I love teasing you, but I don't know how to tease you about that, that you're answering those very good questions. Um, uh, you know, I've been around this a long time. I spent eight and a half terms in Congress. I spent five years as a staffer in the Senate during Watergate. Um, that dates me. Um, I, this is beyond anything I could have anticipated. I remember when the elders in the Senate went to visit or it was reported probably by the New York Times. I don't think you were a reporter yet, David. Uh, that the elders in the Senate went to see Nixon and said, you have been impeached, you will be convicted. Uh, Nixon checked uh, with the Office of Legal Counsel in the Justice Department, which wrote an opinion which said, you can't pardon yourself. Uh, and he, would, which I think he would have tried to do, uh, he resigned and then, he, then Ford pardoned him and the rest is the rest. But he respected the institutions of government and he got out of the way. And uh, that's what happened then. This time I had thought, uh, this is Jane's theory, which of course what didn't happen. I had thought that Mitch McConnell would have spent the last days of the Trump administration rounding up 17 votes, even if they were not made public and going to Trump to say, okay, we've got the votes to convict. You need to resign. Mike Pence will be president for the last few days. Uh, and whether you're pardoned or not is something you have to negotiate, but you need to resign. And that that would have happened. It didn't happen. I. I'm still stunned that it didn't happen and that we are here uh, and that a whole huge group of people is gonna use a procedural argument to duck the issue of whether the president was guilty. I'm not 
you know, it's not my decision, but they're going to duck the decision. And I think that's tragic for our republic. I think we need, people need to be a, a, accountable for what they do. Uh, and I think that uh, we're going to have theater and spectacle and sadly, uh, not a, uh, a, a week that is, is, is what it should be, which is a somber reflection on our institutions of government and the behavior of some people. Only thing I would add to that, Megan, is, um, look, we know the outcome of this trial, right? There are not 17 votes uh, among the Republicans uh, uh, to convict. Um, uh, you, you need two thirds uh, to do the conviction. So everybody knows how this is gonna turn out. But this is one of those moments where the theater and spectacle that Jane refers to when she's right, is in fact the message, right? Because uh, by, you're gonna see a, a trial that is gonna be very video heavy. You're going to see um, those videos of the attack. It's going to be broadcast from the floor of the Senate. So you're seeing it at the scene of the crime, which is all the more remarkable. And the jurors in this case were also witnesses to the crime because they were sitting there at the moment. You're gonna hear the president's own words. They're gonna try to take you back a month ago to month and a few days to the actual moment and how fragile our democracy seemed at that moment. They know they're not gonna get a conviction. They are going to require every Republican to go cast a vote here. What's interesting about the party, and I'd be interested to hear Richard and, and um, you, Megan, and, and others on this, is that in the rewriting of history in the past few weeks, the party has sort of gone parts of the party have gone more off to the Trump side, right? There was more concern about um, going after Liz Cheney for voting for impeachment than for the denunciation uh, of Representative Green and others who have sided with the conspiracy theory side. And so this is gonna play into the great psychodrama of the Republican party of trying to define what it's all about and whether it is the party of Trump or whether it is separating from Trump as McConnell is clearly trying to get them to go do, but a little late. Thank you, really appreciate you willing to go off script like that to, to capture the moment. I don't know if Richard would like to, to add anything before we close out. Well, the future of the Republican party is probably um something that's subject for a little bit longer uh, discussion and speculation. The one thing though, that I guess I would just observe is to David's point, there's a split that one is seeing in the, in the Republican party, obviously. Um, it's the, the Senate is in a very different place than a lot of house members when it comes to Trump and to conspiracy theorists and, and all of this. Um, but the split is not just uh, philosophical, it's also political. And there's a big overarching question that is yet to be resolved by the Republicans. Just to, you know, before the Capitol attack, the presumption was the president, President Trump will at a minimum dangle that he will run again in four years and chilling the field and the competitors and making himself into a kingmaker and everything. He'll have unfettered access to social media. He'll be able to tweet about everything. He'll be able to say nice things about politicians he likes, mobilize voters and donors against politicians he doesn't like. And, you know, kind of um, the way Republicans once lived in semi-fear of Rush Limbaugh coming out against them, this was going to be this on steroids for the four years into the future. Now we're in a situation where Trump probably won't be a candidate for president of the United States and doesn't have access to his big megaphones. He doesn't, can't go on Twitter, can't go on Facebook. And so the question is, is this a different uh, sort of Trump and therefore a different kind of Republican party? Can, can it move on without the fear of Trump pushing them in one direction, which I think a lot of Republicans in the Senate would like to put this behind them and lead it in a different direction. But then in the House, you have a combination of people who genuinely like Trump, genuinely believe in this, in this stuff, 
and others who still think he's out there to kind of railroad them and, and, uh, and push them into primary challenges. So that's the political, apart from the philosophy, that's the political fight that's going to work itself out over the next few months is how much is Trump really a continuing force in the Republican Party and how much is he in the rearview mirror? And that I think just remains to be seen. Megan, as a recovering politician, could I make one last comment? Because listening to Richard inspired this. I mentioned what a difference the Republican elders made in the 70s. I mentioned what a difference Mitch McConnell could have made, I think, at the front end of this. And maybe, just maybe, he'll end up voting to uh, convict. Who knows? I, I doubt it, but maybe. But there's one guy who's not there. And, and listening to Richard reminded me. His name is was John McCain. And I would say if John McCain were still in the Senate, uh, were still with us, and I wish he were, uh, this whole thing might have unfolded somewhat differently. Yeah, I agree with that. Well, thank you all. Um, one, my last one tidbit to add to what Richard was saying about the Republican Party. I think for those of us um, overseas may not know, it's it, the the vote for Liz Cheney, whether or not she was going to keep her leadership position in the Republican Party, um, she won that vote overwhelmingly, even though only 10 members of Congress voted for impeachment of Trump. And I think what's really telling is the fact that she won that overwhelmingly was because that was a secret vote. Um, so you had, I think it's something like three quarters voted for her. And it indicates that if people don't have to go on the record, they may be a lot more concerned about Trump and his future and the hold on the party, but that there is genuine fear either politically or um, in talking to some people, I understand that in some cases it's actual physical fear. And so it's in indicative of how deep the divisions are in our politics and how, how much the Republican party has to do to kind of work itself out of this position. Well, I wanna thank you all for indulging in that little conversation but I don't want any of that to detract from the, the fabulous conversation that David and Jane led us through about one of these real serious uh, national security issues. So David, thank you for bringing your expertise. Jane, thank you for bringing all your style and vigor. And uh, this was a wonderful session. It's great to see everyone this morning on the East Coast. I wish you all uh, a good day and we'll look forward to seeing you again sometime soon. Thank you. <laughs>